happy to have you for this uh, webinar, uh, a webinar made in collaboration between Microsoft and Flare uh, in the external thread hunter series. Uh, it's the first webinar of uh, hopefully a lot more uh, webinar to come. Uh, and today we'll be talking about uh, automating dark web monitoring with Flare and Azure, Microsoft Azure Sentinel. Um, we we have half an hour webinar. Uh, please send your question in the chat. Well, we we spare some time at the end of the presentation to go with with your question. Uh, it's always a pleasure to to read you to read your question and to ask your question to our attendee. So please do not hesitate and ask your question in the chat. Um, and also, we will provide this uh, this. Uh, Free slide deck at the end of the presentation to all the attendees. So, uh, hopefully, for that, you'll get all the information and all the reference that we'll be uh, discussing during that webinar. So, without further ado, uh, let's jump straight into the presentation of our, uh, or of our presenter, of our, of our two presenters for today. We're really happy to have Rudy uh, from, from, from Microsoft, more especially in the cloud security. Solution Architect at Microsoft and GC from Flare with at Product as Customer Success, and myself as a, as a, your moderator for today's panels, uh, also from Flare. So quickly, I'm I'm CEO at Flare, uh, co-founder and CEO at Flare. Uh, happy to be there. As I mentioned today, I'll be your, your webinar, but I'm not the important person today. So I'll turn right I'll turn it I'll turn it right away to Rudy to give a few words about his background and expertise. Awesome, yeah, thanks everyone. Um, <clears throat> my name is Rudy van der Waal. Uh, I'm a cloud solution architect in, uh, for, for Azure, um, and I play in the security space. I've uh, been with Microsoft for about five years now. Uh, previously, I've been uh, a solution architect in apps and infrastructure, so all how do you get your applications and so forth into Azure. And then about a year ago, I moved over into the security space, uh, seeing that we've, you know, we've grown a very, a very prominent presence there. Microsoft, a few words. Yeah, hi, I'm JC. Um, I work in customer success at Flare. I've been here for a year and a half now. Uh, jumped through, you know, a bit of product, a bit of development. And uh, before that, I was more in the data science, machine learning space. Uh, but I've been enjoying the jump into cybersecurity uh, for the past year and a half. Nice. Perfect. Thank you. So we're really happy about this. We're really excited about the subject for today. Uh, I think there's a lot to learn from from the two panelists that we have with us today. Uh, a lot of uh, synergy. I think, you, as you may be aware, there's already some built-in integration between our two solutions. But more generally speaking, we'll talk about uh, like dark web in general, how we can help uh, solution like Flare and Microsoft, but more broadly other type of solution in the market uh, to be into facing those uh, uh, new emerging cyber threats, but also the, the, the cyber threats that are still uh, in the news. If we will be touching on the dark web, we'll be going on the webinar, we'll be also looking as well at how you can do for your employee mistake. Um, but since uh, we are jumping, we will be talking about dark web and deep web and all kind of stuff. I think the first thing to do is to put everyone on the same page. So uh, I'll ask both of you, um, can you explain what is the, the definition or your definition or the definition we'll use for today for the dark web and deep web? Yeah, I can start. Um, unfortunately, I'll, I'll maybe not everyone will be aligned after my uh, definition. Uh, I'm going to give you guys a good old, it depends. Um, because I think very often we see those taglines, you know, those one line one liners of what the dark web is, and I think it misses a lot of the nuance and uh, also like the evolving nature of the dark web. So what I did in preparation for this is I, I gathered a bunch of people and I asked them how do you define dark web, and it quickly became a very heated debate, uh, of course. And so what I do is I'll give two main definitions uh, that are somehow opposed but also complementary, and uh, let you guys decide for yourself. Um, so I think the first one is more classical, would be defining the dark web uh, through anonymity when you're browsing, right? So any time that you'd be browsing uh, in an anonymized way, uh, very often enhanced with like heavy encryption um, and that kind of stuff, uh, you would be considered on the dark web. And so a classic example of this is the Tor browser that uh, a lot of people know. And so using this definition, anytime you're on the Tor browser, you would be considered browsing the dark web since you're you know, IP address is somehow anonymized and, and, and all that kind of stuff. Um, so I think 
two main issues with this. Uh, the first one is that when we say dark web, of course, we think of bad stuff, right? Bad people doing bad stuff. Um, so not everything on Tor browser um, would be considered, um, you know, bad. A lot of people in, in, you know, authoritarian regime would use it to exchange files and documents and all that kind of stuff. So that's the first concern. Second concern on the other side is that those bad actors do not only use dark web anymore. And a lot, and we'll discuss this further, but a lot are increasingly using regular clear web, chat messaging service, even Facebook, in order to, the same, to do the same stuff that they would do on the dark web. And so that's why the second definition that I also like comes in, and it's to define the dark web by its communities. So all wherever those malicious communities exchange is where the dark web is. So that kind of solves those two solutions that I did before. Um, so whether they are on the regular internet, on Telegram, WhatsApp, or on the dark web, uh, th this would be considered the dark web because those malicious actors are there. And I guess the only kind of logical hurdle you would need to get past to accept this definition is that effectively dark web is also now on the clear web. Uh, but I think if you're able to pass that, then this, this definition also makes a lot of sense. From my perspective, um, <clears throat> the dark web is the scary part of the internet for me, right? Um, you know, the dark web is not something that I specialize in. So, uh, you know, a lot of people get their perspective of what the dark web is through what they see on TV or in movies. And it's always, you know, bad things happening. Um, so, you know, to JC's uh, explanation, that's that's a really good and technical explanation of really what it is. And it's really just about sharing information in an anonymous fashion that, um, that's, you know, that's got a specific intent um, that, you know, you, you want to kind of uh, say anonymously, right? So, you know, totally agree with JC's uh, response, but uh, it's the scary part that I try not to tread towards. <laughs> Yeah, so I think you can you may hear in that presentation some 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 um, alternative definitions such as uh, illicit communities or criminal underground. When we say that, we usually we refer to the, the nature guys. of the information you can find on this community, and this is how we define. Basically, mm -hmm. this is where, as a company, and, and to protect the organization, we'll be looking into uh, to find information that could be relevant in order to prevent uh, or uh, or reduce uh, cybercrime. Um, so thank you for that. Uh, on, in terms of uh, now that we have a better idea of the complexity of the challenge is facing, because basically the information is, that is relevant is all over the place, not only on a specific one technology uh, encryption tool, but basically the, the, the dark web and the illicit communities are spread out in a different area. Um, can you explain, both of you, how your solution work together in order to efficiently solve the problem? So maybe Rudy, if you want to start. Yeah, sure. Um, so, <clears throat> you know, let's let's talk a little bit about what Sentinel. So, you know, Sentinel is is our cloud sim that we've built uh, inside of the Microsoft Azure cloud. Um, it's been around for a couple of years now, and we're taking a little bit of a different approach to uh, sim than traditional other vendors might. Um, you know, our differentiator <clears throat> in the sim space is that we really believe that you need to understand context, right? The context of the threat that you are facing and, um, you know, use AI and ML models and stuff like that in order to really be able to, when you raise an alert or an incident to someone like a, um, a security analyst, um, it needs to have the correct context, right? Uh, as soon as you have, you know, incidents and alerts and so forth that pop up because someone put in a bad password or an incorrect password in some system that doesn't provide you context or it's not necessarily even a threat. Um, and, you know, what we're trying to work towards is really give relevant threats or relevant incidents that poses a real risk to, um, you know, to the business uh, so that we can effectively remediate that and not suffer from the, you know, from the threat fatigue or the alert fatigue that you might get inside of SIM systems that really just produces a whole bunch of noise with not a lot of value. So, you know, from, from our perspective, uh, we partner with companies like Flare in order to give us that correct context so that it's something that we actually want to take uh, to heart and raise awareness or do whatever it is that we want to do um, in order to 
perceive that there is an actual threat and figure out what is our business process in order to neutralize that threat and to a certain degree automate that process and i'll kind of stop there because yeah, it makes sense. I think you raise a good point about context because context for different companies is different and this intimate understanding of the internal mm -hmm. of the company correlated to the, the data that is outside of the company really give that, that full view and that full understanding of, 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 the, of the current trends in that scape. Uh, GC, do you want to, um, how, how would you describe like how, how, like how, how a solution like, like yours can actually help into that contextualization and better understanding of, the, of those community? Yeah, yeah, sure. Well, first, like I guess, I, as a high level, what we do at Flare with, with our with our platform Firework is we, it's it's a SaaS platform, and we dynamically maps uh, your organization's external attack surface that we call, which is basically trying to map out all publicly available information that could be used by malicious actors uh, to gain access to your network or to attack your network, and so. Uh, another issue that comes up often when you try to get all that public information is that, uh, you know, there's, it's a lot, right? And there's a lot of noise, uh, as Rudy mentioned. And so we try to add, again, this contextualization and uh, kind of to, to, to help and make sure that all the alerts that ends up in your, in your inbox or in your Sentinel uh, instance is relevant. And I think just the overarching, to finish off, the, the overarching idea behind this is that, you know, after many years of, of cybersecurity field as a general, trying to optimize and make sure that corporate networks are absolutely secured and airtight and make sure that all the data stays inside. A lot of people realize this is kind of an impossible task, right? Data will get out. And so what we're trying to do is to give you back that visibility of trying to figure out where is that data and remediate before, again, bad actors uh, take advantage of it. And so... With Sentinel, what we did is that historically we've been sending alerts through email. Um, and so right off the bat, you can see some kind of limitations of that, especially when you have a big organization. And uh, we decided to integrate with uh, Sentinel um, first. And so now all your alerts can be sent to that CM system and uh, do all the fun stuff that we'll get into, I'm sure, in, in a few seconds. Yeah, uh, I think you mentioned you mentioned a valid point in here in terms of um, uh, how there's a lot of data. And I mean, we know companies have been looking for like illicit communities and cyber crime data for a while, like, but historically we were going to a SIM. So basically data point going into, into a big bucket of data and how can the playbook, how can the SOAR integration can facilitate the, 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 the processing of that information and, and the value and, and the insight that the company can, can get out of those huge pile of data that's coming from, from the external point of view. So I think, I, I would like to kind of bring you a little bit more on the concept of like how can playbooks and the SOAR can be a game changing here. Rudy, you want to start off with the yeah. playbook explanation? Yeah, for sure. Okay. So, you know, coming back to context, um, you know, Mathieu, what you mentioned there is you normally would traditionally put a whole bunch of data inside of a SIM and then you're kind of searching through that in order to kind of provide you with context. Um, so, you know, do I need to do something or not? And, you know, the approach really that we do from a different side uh, in the Sentinel world is, um, you know, find the context and have that one event or a couple of different events that provide evidence to maybe an impending threat to the company or, or something like that. And traditionally, you would do that after the fact, right? Um, you would kind of catch that uh, once a password spray is happening or once... Um, you know, X, Y, or Z, a user clicks on a phishing link or something like that. And the thing that changes it here is, you know, the, the, the Flare system is what's really taking the data that is in a, uh, you know, it's, it's really unstructured, it's conversations, it's a whole bunch of different things that, you know, machines don't really like. Uh, to interpret and bring that back into something that we can actually take action on, right? So, you know, something, uh, credentials or credentials have been leaked or something like that. Getting those back into a table inside of Sentinel or through an alert really enables us to take, you know, correlate that back into, is there an actual threat that's emerging? Hey, there is, uh, you know, uh, a, a password that's been leaked and we've identified that it's the specific user ID. Um, 
that is something that you can proactively go and do something about through a playbook inside of Sentinel. Now, playbooks are built on uh, Azure Logic Apps, uh, which is a workflow system, if you want to call that. If you've ever used uh, the Power Platform and uh, in the Microsoft Power Platform, then you'll be familiar with it. But you can basically build that process, right? So you know, we've identified a user um, which has got credentials that's leaked on some sort of platform. Uh, what do we want to do with that? Well, maybe we want to enforce password changes. We want to heighten that user's risk score. Um, all of those kind of things can be automated within a playbook. When it starts becoming a little bit more sophisticated, that's when you uh, are probably not going to, going to do too much specifically on your infrastructure, uh, but you're going to raise awareness, right? Now, <clears throat> normally, these kind of things, let's take an example. Let's say you've got a lookalike domain that you're looking for. Um, you've got a big presence uh, on the consumer side, um, and you know we find that there's a, a domain for sale that's very close to my business's domain. Um, there's not necessarily something that you can necessarily do about that right at that point, uh, but you can a lot faster start communicating to your internal teams or to your customers that, hey, there's this new domain that's out there, uh, it's not ours. If you get a phishing email, um, check the links, uh, do this, do that, do that. Um, from a playbook perspective, that might be in the sense of you won't automate that whole whole sort of scenario because there's a whole bunch of human intervention that probably needs to happen there. But what you would do is, you know, maybe automatically uh, go and notify uh, PR teams of this event that's happened. Um, go and build a case in your system that you use for ITSM or something like that. Say, here's a security incident. We probably need to, to do something about it, right? So it's all about reacting faster and using some sort of automation within that process of how we're neutralizing it um, to, uh, to yeah. give that yeah. result. I, I think an interesting point as well as you're bringing is the, 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 the hybrid set of information that's coming from all kinds of sources. Like it's not about like looking at, at, at exchange, at, like at writing exchange between cyber criminals, looking at like Domains that are being created, like mm -hmm. artifacts that are that we can see. Uh, can we relate that to some event in the past? GC, mm -hmm. I, I would like to hear you more on that, on like how valuable and how like, I'd say mandatory right now is able to do the link between all of those data points that are a different nature in order to 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 integrate that. And is is there anything that you, we need to do before sending it to a sim? Is, is there any processing needs to be done in order to 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 enable the SOAR or the SIM to be more efficient uh, in, in in a solution like broad monitoring at at scale. Yep. Yeah. Sure. I guess two two main things. Um, I think the first one is I mentioned the risk. Uh, so of course we use we have a classification engine, um, machine learning based, but also some more you know deterministic heuristics uh, in order to give you a bit more context on to how relevant every document that we collect is. Um, and then the second the second point for sure is to cross-reference actors. So, uh, you know, we started at Flare Systems with dark web monitoring. Of course, now we do a lot more, uh, like I said, on the clear web, looking at things like GitHub. But what's interesting uh, on both of those, for example, dark web and uh, GitHub is that actors have reputations and they want to maintain those. And so what we do is we, uh, we're able to, to I guess, cross-reference actors throughout different platforms uh, since they're using things like PGP keys to ensure and to show who they are. And so that's a very interesting thing. We have a lot of, uh, we have some customers in, in law enforcement agencies and they're able to uh, do very advanced investigation by looking and following cyber criminals. And, you know, we've been indexing uh, mo most major dark web platforms since 2017. And so even those platforms that are now taken down, uh, for example, Canadian headquarters was a big one in Canada. Uh, we're still able to, to find uh, past data about specific actors that might now be operating in new platforms, uh, such as We the North, uh, for example. And if you want, I, I think you, you, it, it's an interesting uh, use case and an interesting story here. And I'll, 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 I'll like to hear you more on that, uh, like ever changing uh, underground of criminal underground. If you have one advice to give the company uh, to follow this ever changing uh, illicit communities, like 
Wow. Build the, the DeLorean and go back in the past is my uh... <laughs> no, because, right. and I can give you I can give you an example. Is is it's just that it's so fast, like you mentioned, and it moves so quickly um, that it's something that you would need to be immersed into sit for for years, right? So we have, for example, clients that have been like that, right? Yeah. Since they were fifteen, sixteen, they've been into that weird thing that's the dark web, however you define it, and they've been looking at new website, new people. And today they've been using our tools for sometimes now for their for pen testing and other type of use cases. And they, and they're almost disappointed because now their knowledge that they've acquired for so many years is abstracted away in the platform. And people that have little knowledge of the dark web are able to. It's basically a search engine, right? So it's like a Google for, and so and so that's a that's a interesting use case. Yeah, I think the challenge has become more into contextualization and prioritization, and like right. now that that the pre-processing and the harvesting is done, like the actionability, the act, how it's actionable and how you can actionate that is still is still definitely a challenge for yeah. for companies. Uh, Rudy, have any advice on how to follow those contents levels in uh, threat landscape as as an organization? Uh, either a mid-side of organization, a bigger organization, I'll, I'll let you pick here, whatever you prefer. Yeah, so, you know, the, the, the problem that, um, that you'll always have is there's such a vast amount of data out there that uh, you kind of need to get into a, a tangible, um, you know, into a tangible chunk of data that you can actually do something with, right? Um, and, and that's where I see the integration work really well, um, you know, if you, if I kind of put my technical sentinel hat on and I go, well, uh, how would you manage that? Um, let's say if you didn't have firework, well, it just becomes a lot uh, more difficult to do that, right? Because you you're kind of left on your own. So with this integration, you you um, you, you kind of let you perform the best where you can, where where you guys are specialized in, um, and then find that data in a in a, in a schema that I can actually go and do something with, right? Like, I don't know what's the score of a bad actor. I don't know what's the, you know, I'm talking from a customer's perspective, um, but that's something that you guys focus all day long on. So I'm gonna trust your data so that, you know, if you're saying that this is a classification A or B or one or two or whatever uh, bad actor, that's probably something that I wanna take into account and apply to my businesses security posture um, and let you focus on what you need to do here so you know I, I would get I would I guess my advice or my recommendation would be you know you do need something you know as uh, your business becomes more and more publicly um, uh, uh, what's the word that I'm looking for, uh, popular, or as more people start knowing about your company, you uh, you need something like this that you can, you know, get some more insights into the things that's outside of the realm of control that you have, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Today, we don't really have, um, you know, firewall is not a security perimeter anymore. Like that's, that's perimeter has been gone for a long time now. Uh, but you still have that other perimeter, which is, what are people thinking and saying about my company that might pose a threat uh, to my company, right? And that's kind of the lens that we're getting that we didn't have before. Mm -hmm. and and just, uh, and go ahead. I just wanted to add, yeah. Um, so again, you know, and I think the key here is is the speed uh, to remediation. And and I think our goal was always to to allow people to remediate fast or at least faster than than the malicious actors. And I think that's one of the greatest addition when. Uh, you integrate your firework instance to, to Azure Sentinel is that this quick remediation as to you receive the email when this information is online and you can remediate becomes yeah. almost instantaneous with those things like playbook and automated action, right? You can trigger a, a password reset in the AD, uh, in a click of a finger, so you can close port or add security to your web application firewall, that kind of stuff. So that's, that was the main, I think, uh, faster remediation. Yeah. And, and Rudy, uh, you, you look like you want to add something on that. So I'll, I'll, do you want to uh, compliment? Yes. Uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, so yeah, to, to add to that, you know, um, companies that I work for, you know, that have their own socks, that have their own um, security teams, you know, there's a lot that needs to happen um, in order to communicate what is a perceived threat to the relevant teams, right? Um, you know, a lot of teams, like I see a lot of customers these days where they have public facing applications that is being run by an in-house development team. Um, you know, that's great on getting telemetry from 
those different systems to a SOC to go, you know, find different types of threats. But the feedback loop when there's something that's not really within their control might be a lot longer, right? So, you know, that's where this integration becomes really valuable because now once you once you are uh, receiving those types of alerts from the firework system, you can start correlating that and mapping that to, to stuff like, hey, this it's just, it's actually attacking this application. Let's immediately notify the developers. Might not be something specifically technical that we can do, but it is something that we can raise awareness on immediately. Um, and there's no longer that gap of wait for communication so that you know we're on high alert <clears throat> to say that there's an imp impending threat coming or this is what's happened. We need to go and change code or whatever the case may be. Right. Yeah, I think that the big highlight that I'm, I'm getting and the, the, the big takeaway that I'm thinking is a SOAR is definitely like have is, is an important piece of a, of a good cybersecurity program. But the, the most important thing is take the time and put the effort to personalize that SOAR because you're the one that have the knowledge and, and the insight of your company. If you don't put that in the SOAR within your playbook, you can aggregate as much data as, as, as you can. but the value won't necessarily be there. It's really how what, what is the knowledge that you put into the playbook that, that will make a difference, right? Yeah, so SOC uh, operations is no longer a static thing. It never was, but there was always this <clears throat> perceived notion in the past that, you know, I set up my rules, I set up my, my schedules and my remediations and life is good, right? Um, but that's not the world that we live in anymore. Um, you know, even with just a system like Firework, um, these things change every day, and as a as a company that might have a security team or might not, um, you constantly need to, on a daily basis, keep up to date with what's out there happening in the world uh, because it's no longer static. And um, and and this is a really good compliment to, to 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 keep you on your toes on what might be happening that might be in my my, my company. Speaking of a of a current uh, situation and trend landscape, I think we don't. Like doing a presentation like this, we need to talk about ransomware. I think it's still it's still some it's still a big issue. It's still something that is concerning organization. And now I, I'll I'll keep the question really broad, uh, voluntarily. And what is the million? I'd say it's the million dollar question. Uh, how could technology help mitigate those ransomware attacks? Like technology in general, not I I, I guess what we have here have some limits and like how we can add some technology to, to, to the recipe to be even more uh, efficient. So I, I'm curious to hear you about, okay, you have the challenge to start ransomware attack. What do you do first? What do you put in place? I can, I can start this off. Um, yeah, big question. Uh, lots of uh, pressure here. Um, so I think the, the first thing is like, I guess, like how the, the question is, how initial access or how to prevent initial access that leads to ransomware. Uh, if we're talking about prevention, that's the main part. And I think one uh, big part of that is often social engineering, um, which is not something we specialize on, but it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a big, big use case, um, emails, phishing, all that kind of stuff. Um, what, we, what we cover a bit more is all, like I said, the, the technical leakage or the information that's out there that allows uh, criminals to gain the that initial access. And I mean, fast evolving landscape, if I just pick one example, um, I, I would probably pick the Genesis market, which is simply a, a website where they sell, you know, infected or hacked personal computers. Uh, it's a relatively new website, became super popular. Uh, we added it to the monitoring. Uh, Electronic Arts, uh, it came out recently, were, were breached. Um, and they were they had their their source code for FIFA, the new FIFA game, um, stolen, and it was realized that the initial access was made through those. So this guy, he bought or guy or girl, he bought a for fifty dollars uh, infected computer who had access to the Slack corporate channel, and then again bit of social engineering, and he was in. And so, adding those kind of sources to uh, our kind of ongoing monitoring again allows you to to somehow prevent or to minimize the risk of that kind of information being out there and being leveraged uh, by bad actors. And then I guess, yeah, sorry. sorry. I'd say it's also also a, a good a good use case to talk about security in depth of having multiple control. Like, yes, you get internal access, but then after what you can do, right? 
Correct. Yeah, for sure. And then I guess the, uh, the last step is post post breach, which is also something that uh, you know it's 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 very important for for firms. And I think that's where the dark web monitoring comes in place because you know the information that was stolen or leaked. Uh, can take weeks or years to appear on the dark web. And so having that ongoing monitoring without even thinking about it helps because, of course, if it's the role of one person to do that, after three months, he'll check out and be like, yep, there's nothing, we're good. So again, like somehow automating those actions that you you you, you can trust humans a bit less on. Yeah. Yeah, and from my perspective, you know, uh, within the Microsoft Security Story, we have a whole bunch of different different systems that that um, enrich that that uh, telemetry in you know is there a ransomware attack that's happening and and how we remediate those but you know to JC's point it's that initial um, social engineering that might happen that you might not get um, from other different systems whether that be from us or, or other any other vendors that um, that provides that context again right that perks up the ears to go, um, there was the following discussion being had somewhere, you know, on the dark web. Um, we've identified users, we've identified people, um, or we've identified, you know, assets within within the company. Um, so let's put those on high alert. Put them in a watch list inside of Sentinel. Um, if something happens with those specific entities, then uh, let's let's raise the the categorization to critical so that we can immediately remediate and see what's going on there. Um, from a post breach perspective. You know, my perspective to this is, uh, you know, when you're in a ransomware situation where you're just trying to uh, get rid of the fire, um, you have all of your resources and maybe you have multiple vendors in your company trying to just get uh, the, the, the threat neutralized. Um, you might have to JC's point, have data that, that's actually leaking there already out on the web somewhere that you're not aware of. And that brings back the feedback loop, right? So bringing back that telemetry to Sentinel to go, you know, the fire is out, um, it's, there's still some smoldering, but now we see that there's actually the following data that's out there you know, in the wild. Um, so again, let's perk up our ears and raise the threat level uh, for whatever we've been able to identify and make people aware that you know, the fire might be out, but uh, there's still a lot of work to be done and we still need to be vigilant because the following different types of things have happened, right? So it's it's really bringing that feedback loop into not just have your defenses up, but being critically aware of things that might be happening once the perceived threat is gone. Um, we are arriving to to the conclusion of that uh, that webinar. Um, I, I, first of all, I just want to take a few, a few, a few, a few minutes to uh, a few seconds to actually, if you have any question uh, to the attendee, uh, if you have any question, that's now an excellent time to ask your question uh, before we kind of get into the final remark or maybe the last question. Um, we'll have, we'll be happy to hear from uh, from what you like, what you're curious to hear to 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 get more information about, or if you have any question for to panelists, that is, uh, as the time before we jump into um, the last question, I would say, um, we talk about ransomware, we talk about attack, uh, I think it came back as well to the concept of cyber hygiene, like you, dis you we describe about social engineering, uh, but also having kind of an understanding, we, we talk about understanding of the, the company, I think it passed through uh, having a good asset management, a good vulnerability management, having a good password hygiene. Um, what what's your what are your thoughts? Is what is your final um, thinking of like? Yes, we have the dark web, but there's other things we need to monitor or to look after. Uh, what would be also other priority, other type of data that you that you see integrating uh, well in a store in order to um, uh, to complement the information that that Flare or another event or another company that provides external information, uh, uh, you, you could add up on, in, in, on top of that data. So let's be quick on this one because we got actually one question in the chat. So I'll kind of give you. Uh, I I will I will summarize of like aside of monitoring the dark web, what is the other type of information that you see well integrating in the store? I guess I think. 
I'll go more in the avenue of the low hanging fruits in terms of security and also in the preventions uh, that we that we mentioned before. And I'll sh uh, selflessly uh, point back to the mini series that we did of cybersecurity tips. And I think that a lot of the low hanging fruits that people underestimate are things like, you know, multi-factor authentication, uh, password reuse uh, and all that kind of stuff. And I think that if anyone, everyone was using those, then uh, then I think uh, our, our work would be a lot simpler um, for sure. Yeah. Um, you want to go, uh, Rudy, do you have any, uh, any thoughts on that or we jump straight to the next question? Up to you. Let's jump to the next question because there's... Perfect. Let's go with that. So uh, we have Mauricio that asked a question on the chat. Um, and I think it's, it's, I think the concrete example that was giving resonated because I think right now what we are looking to, to, to get here is, can you give an example of like the kind of alert that the company can receive from Flare, how it could be integrated into a playbook? And if you have any example that, that, that supports uh, what we've been talking about for the last half an hour, I think that will be uh, super appreciated. Yeah, um, sure. I guess so. There's again uh, many sources from which we ingest data, and depending on what you're monitoring, what assets you're monitoring, it could you could receive different types of alerts. But if we take a typical, Sorry. we're back. <laughs> <laughs> a little bit of stress here, but it's fine. Everything's um, back. Go ahead, GC. I think I lost sound. No, we can hear you. Everything's fine, GC. Rudy, do you want right. to go in the meantime? Yeah, I'll, I'll go in the meantime. So, you know, if I think of a typical alert that we might um, get, you know, let's say, for example, um, uh, there's leaked credentials that's found uh, somewhere on the dark web. Now, from the Flare system, you know, that type of alert will go into Sentinel, into a table in Sentinel that you can... Um, and then do something with, right? So there might be entities that's identified there. So those be user IDs, um, uh, passwords that might be used. Um, so, so some of the things that you could do there from a proactive perspective is within a playbook, have something like, you know, for all the entities that you've actually identified, maybe it's a list of, of user IDs uh, that's been linked or passwords, user ID com uh, combinations, you know, do something proactive like, well, enforce password changes. Um, if they don't have MFA enabled on systems, that's when we, we're gonna start doing stuff like adding in conditional policies inside of Azure AD or something like that um, in order to raise the posture to that, um, to that, uh, to that account. Um, if these are actual users also, you can kind of take that a little bit of a step further to go, you know, there's these user IDs that's been leaked or there's maybe you know a phishing attempt to that that we know of that's that that might go to those specific users, that might trigger something like a training event, right? That might not be something that's automated to the nth degree, but uh, it would raise that awareness. Then, so maybe in a playbook you have uh, you know maybe a, an alert that gets sent off to a training instructor to say, hey, we've got the following user that's been identified in leaked credentials. Uh, might be good to have a quick 30-minute call with them to give them some training on what to look out for. There's something that, that might be specific to them. And I think it, it answers also another question that we had that was uh, – Dark web result, and that's always actionable. How you can uh, how can Sentinel help with that? I think the example here is pretty clear. Like you take a leak credential, can you correlate that to a phishing campaign? Can you correlate that to uh, an, an unauthorized attempt? And then in terms of in terms of answer, okay, let this this person needs some training. Like we want to help that person become better and better in cybersecurity and basically improve yeah. the organizational global security. So I think it's a super good example. Uh, GC, I think you're back with us. Uh, do you have any? Um, any, like, you uh, want to continue a little bit where, where, where you were at and, and finish your turn of thought? We can't hear you now. <laughs> we can't hear you still. <laughs> I'm sorry, GC. Uh, so we'll, we'll have, we'll have a last question. And I think, uh, Rudy, I'll, I'll, yeah. I'll, for sure, I'll turn it to you. Uh, can, can Flare or Sentinel provide a visibility to upper management to the trends and the trend landscape targeting in the suite? So kind of a concept of, providing or uh, in, information to upper management and benchmarking your company uh, with other company within your industry? So 
from a sentinel perspective, we don't typically we don't benchmark companies against each other, of course, right? But uh, you know, within um, my uh, company, you know, let's say I am using Sentinel. Um, it's it's more from a what's the risk factor to a specific entity that be a device, a user, um, something that is tangible, um, a network or something like that. Uh, so it's kind of more prioritizing or categorizing within my own environments. What is that sp- perceived threat to that specific? Um, entity and then do something about it. Um, You know, when it comes to playbooks and how you remediate these kind of things, you know, the thing about this is that, um, you know, the dark web is an ever-changing world. It's not something that you can always automate. Um, You know, what do you do from that from a central perspective? And I'll I'll come back to context and and awareness, right? Mm -hmm. A lot of, or I would say normally, like most of the time, uh, when a perceived threat has been identified on something like the dark web. Um, There's not necessarily something you can physically do about it because you haven't really identified a user or as long as you can identify an entity um, that I have control over, now I can proactively go and physically do something inside of the playbook. Mm -hmm. But if it's not something that is physically touchable or, or it's not an identity or something like that, now you're kind of relying on, well, I need to actually now just create awareness, right? That something might be happening like a phishing campaign. Um, there might be word on the street that there is a phishing campaign, you know, someone's trying to sell, um, some, user identities or whatever, but there's a phishing campaign that's going to be targeted at my company, right? Mm-hmm. I can't do anything about it because I don't have any entities that's been identified, but I'm going to know that there is some sort of bad actor that is going to, um, that's going to target my company. Mm-hmm. So let's be proactive about that. Provide some training. Hey, don't click on things that you don't know, stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and that's kind of where Centaur comes back in again. The, the key here is identifying what your business process is mm-hmm. uh, and then enacting a based on that. Based on that. Yeah, I think, I think the, the, the key word here is awareness, even though it's not necessarily purely actionable, kind of giving that visibility and, and, yeah. and sending that awareness and also also reporting on the action that have been taken, like because of yeah. that increase of trend, this is the playbook that triggered and this is the action we're taking. Yeah. So I think definitely that, that could be a, a, a nice and well, a, a super valuable tool to 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 engage conversation on upper management of cyber security. Yeah. I, I, I think you're still muted. So I think uh, we'll have, unfortunately, we'll stop the webinar here. I would like to thank you, GC. Uh, thank you to be to be here with us. Um, uh, thank you for your time. Thank you for your insight uh, that you provide. Rudy, uh, it was the first webinar. Hopefully, it won't be the last. We're, we're super glad to have you on board and to, and, and to get your experience and, and your know-how of that space. Uh, I, I've learned a lot. I, I, I really enjoyed the conversation and thank you for being here today with us. Thanks so much for having me. Look forward to the next one. Perfect. To all the attendees, thank you very much to be to be with us. Hopefully we'll, we'll see you at the next webinar. And as we mentioned at the beginning, we'll provide you with the material, the, the material that, we, that we shared. If you have any follow-up question, if you want to have any additional in, information about Sentinel or Flare, or uh, please uh, reach out to uh, to the to, to the contact form on Flare, or um, please reach out to the email that you receive. We'll be able to to take it from there. All right. Awesome. Again, thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much for for being today, and uh, hopefully we'll see you at the uh, next webinar. Awesome. Goodbye. Perfect. Thank you. Bye bye.